Good morning to you. It's up to the minute time. Good to see you with us. I'm Todd Duplantis, and we've got your HCC news and information for the next half hour. I know we don't have to go over it. The Astros lost last night. So uh, end of the World Series for them. But hey, they had a good season. A lot of questions going into next season, but We've got a whole year to worry about that. So, hey, let's get into today's show. Beautiful day outside, and we've got a great show lined up for you. Uh, we're hoping to check in later on with the show with a staff member who's been here at HCC for more than 40 years. We'll also be talking about some video games, some pop culture, horror stories, and more in just a few, few moments. But uh, Tony Rayo Sutherland is with me right now. And Tony, um, it's not a bad Wednesday so far. Uh, we uh, terrible game last night, but uh, hey, that's just oh, the way things go. I was I was crying from the very beginning almost. <laughs> One of those things where it just got bad and just got worse, and never got, got any worse. better. Yeah. But just, any better. Oh well, that's okay. But they made it to the World Series, so hey, that's something good to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they made it to the World Series. Three out of five years they've been in the World Series. And, uh, you know, one thing, they lose players. And I don't know, it's a warning for all you players out there. All the fantastic players, when they're with the Astros, they seem to go other places, and they wind up watching the Astros from their new team uh, going to the World Series without them. Yeah, so uh, stay with the Astros and win with them. <laughs> That's right. Stay with them, win with them. We'll see what happens, you know. Um, a lot of questions going into next year. But, hey, you know, one thing that's not questionable, we are on HCC TV with the rebroadcast of the show at noon and at 5 p.m. So if you don't catch us live on Facebook or YouTube like you're doing right now, you can always catch the rebroadcast. And they can also follow us in social media as well, Tony. Absolutely. Just look for Houston Community College District on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Don't just look for HCC. Go for Houston Community College District, and you'll find us, follow us, and... It'll be great. <laughs> It'll be great. Okay. All right. Another thing that's great, too, we're going to try to check in right now with a guest that you're going to be interviewing shortly. Uh, Glenn Smith is with the Coleman College for Health Sciences. Glenn, are you there? And uh, doesn't look like he's there yet. So we're going to try to check in with him later on in the show. But first things first, we're going to check in with Jeff Rauner. He uh, joins us several times and he's back again. Jeff is a Houston Press contributor. He talks about video games, pop culture. And now he's an author of a book called Strange Words, Stranger Words. We're going to get to that in a moment. Jeff, good to see you again. Hey, Todd, good to see you again. Yeah, so uh, holiday season is coming upon us. A lot of choices out there for buying some games. Uh, we talk video games a lot because HCC has a great uh, department where we teach our students how to program and build video games. So they may be interested in this. What are some of the hot titles this year that people are buying? Well, you know, the best way to make sure that you could actually win a game is to make is to make it yourself. So yeah. I'm sure everybody's going to be in the mood for that in Houston at the moment. Um, big game this year that everybody should be putting on their gift, gift list is Psychonauts 2. The first Psychonauts, when it came out, just completely changed everything people knew about how writing could happen in video games. It was all about going inside people's heads and helping them deal with emotional problems while also keeping up this really... Um, just just quirky humor, very, very adult writing. And the sequel had, you know, had very big shoes to fill. And it's it it fills them very, very adequately. You um, still have the same, you know, third person platforming, right. all that's going on, but now it's tackling really big issues like addiction or having a friend go through um, violent radicalization. Um, just it's a really, really moving video game. That's just also a lot of fun to play and extremely pretty on top of it. And I understand Jack Black is involved <laughs> with this game. Yeah, Jack Black plays um, he plays a brain in a jar, which we've all wanted to do at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but he's also a character who was part of these psychic investigators, but he was also a musician. 
So he, you go through this world built like the Beatles magical mystery tour that you have to navigate. And it's, and he just, and he gets a big song in it and he just nails every moment of it. It's my favorite like guest appearance in a video game of all time easily. Uh, other titles that are out there. Um, what about Kena Bridge of Spirits? Is that another popular one? Kena is um, it's the first um, game from a group called Ember Labs, which is this black led uh, developer out of California. <laughs> they got started doing uh, fan films of like for Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. So you can go and look that up on YouTube and it's well worth your time. But this is their first attempt to really put their own game together. It's another third person platformer. There was a lot going on that year. The new Ratchet and Clank with Psychonauts with Kena. Um, he's, the best stuff of this generation was, you know, family friendly kind of third person platformers. And it's just really moving. It's very pretty. You play as this young woman who is traveling through this enchanted forest and she helps people who have died move on to the next phase. Unfortunately, that usually involves hitting them with a magic stick, but um, <laughs> it gets the job done eventually. <laughs> Uh, Resident Evil, that thing just keeps pumping out more games. And, you know, there's one thing I'm kind of excited about. There's a movie coming out. I don't know if you've seen the previews for that, but a Resident Evil, another movie, which looks like it may be somewhat of an origin story. It's I'm one of those people who went and saw the original series of films on the yeah. first day. And I look, I love that horrid, trashy film very much. But this looks like a much more faithful adaptation. It looks like it takes the source material much more seriously. And I really like where the series is going. They've basically got two tracks right now. They're remaking a lot of their PlayStation 1 video games. They've remade uh, 2 and Nemesis, and those are great. But the first-person versions that are on right now, and that's where Village came in this year, yeah. are also just really amazing. In this case, um, the hero goes to a titular village in somewhere in Europe. We're never really told where. And you've got nine foot tall vampire ladies, you've got fish monsters, you've got werewolves, you've got Frankensteins, Frank's Einstein. I don't know what the plural of that is. <laughs> and it's just, it's over the top. It's utterly ridiculous. And it is so fun. It's also got the scariest segment I have ever played in a video game, period. You're a, you're stalked by a giant baby. And it's, it's, I was started to replay the game and I quit just because I didn't want to do that section again. That's how terrifying it is. Well, you know, Resident Evil had that effect when it first came out because, quite honestly, the first game was pretty terrifying. You'd sit there and you'd play it in a dark room. Man, it really cre was creepy, and I guess they're continuing that with uh, giant babies and nine-foot vampire ladies. <laughs> it's, it, it is definitely one of those things that's just – they've never lost the ability to scare. Like, early, uh -huh. like later segments before they did the reboots and before they started the first person got kind of weird, famously. They started, like – punching boulders and like guys could get hit by trains and nothing would happen. It got very weird and action-y. So it's nice to see the games get back to their roots and actually be terrifying. Are you looking forward to seeing this origin movie that's kind of going to be coming out? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I can't wait for it. It, it, it really looks like it's captured the spirit and, you know, and if it's bad, then it'll be just like the first game. So it's literally a win-win. Uh, what is this unsighted thing that's uh, being announced from Nintendo? That's um that is a very interesting game. It just came out. I've only started playing. I've only only about an hour into it, but it's already one of my favorite things that I've done. Um, Unsighted is a cyberpunk isometric Metroidvania, which means that it's got retro graphics. It's top down like an old Legend of Zelda game. Um, you adapt your character with chips, which helps them change their various personalities and the way they interact with the world. It's all about the idea that humanity has left their the automatons, the robots they've built behind, right. and these automatons are trying to build their own society apart from humanity. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of fighting, and it's it's a great um, allegory for um, chronic health problems and how we've sort of let that go in America and the world in general. And it's also made by two trans women out of Brazil. So there's a lot of there's a lot of playing with gender there's a lot of playing with identity it's you know it's a true cyberpunk kind of game which we've all been waiting for since cyberpunk disappointed us uh you also have a book coming out with some horror stories maybe you can tell us a bit about that i uh this is my third book my second book of horror short story stranger words was something i've worked on for 
a couple of years and it's 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 absolutely amazing that it completed um it's got a video game tie-in one of the horror stories is about a person who goes to hell and they're sentenced to be the first goomba in super mario brothers just getting stomped over and over and over again <laughs> as their punishment and it helps them learn it's we just finished halloween there's a story in there about a, a department store where evil elves come in right at the stroke of midnight on november 1st and take all the halloween stuff and replace it with free christmas stuff but it's like a deal with the devil thing you have and it's written in a form of corporate memo so it's like here's how you deal with the evil elves that come through and uh just make sure you're you're following all your guidelines so where can they find your book it's it's on amazon it's on barnes and noble just stranger words <laughs> you can look up jeff browner i'm the only jeff browner on the planet so if you type that into google you will find me you know, you mentioned you talk about pop culture a bit. Before we go, real quickly, I want to ask you, did you see the latest Halloween movie, number one? And what were your thoughts? Are you looking forward to the next one? The latest Halloween, Halloween Kills, um, looked like it kind of went off the rails, but that's the that's yeah. the series as a whole. I'm one of the few people who actually likes the Rob Zombie version, so you should probably not take my opinion on Halloween very seriously. Well, I'm looking forward to the next one because this last one I thought was a big nothing burger. I wasn't really happy with it at all. So I'm um, hoping uh, Halloween ends will be better, but we'll we'll see what happens. Jeff Rauner, he's with the Houston Press. He's got a new book out called Stranger Words. Check it out. We'll have a link uh, to it in our social media posts. Jeff, thanks for being here always. Good to see you, Todd. Take care. Okay, we're going to try to check in with Glenn Smith again. Uh, he is with the uh, Nuclear Medicine Technology Program and Clinical Coordinator at HCC's Coleman College for Health Sciences. Glenn, can you hear us? Let's see if we can hear you. Well, it looks like we still have some mic issues, so we're going to have to check in again with you, Glenn, at another time. But uh, thanks for thanks for being here because we were we were planning on talking a bit about Coleman's uh, nuclear medicine technology clinical program uh, or program out there, uh, and they are uh, certainly taking off in this arena. They've got a lot of things out there, Tony, that are um, really star attractions over at Coleman College of Health Sciences. You know, one of the things we always talk about on the show, um, the respiratory therapy program. And I know you've been involved with some of the interviews, but that's really taken off in the last year because um, I think we're one of the first with it, but they, uh, this being with patients being treated for COVID, um, it helps them recover from COVID. And it seems like now it's been more popular than ever. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the thing about Coleman, too, is they're right in the middle of the Texas Medical Center. I mean, what better place? Uh, all the partnerships that Coleman right. has with all the, the hospitals around them and everything. So, you know, they get the latest information on everything and the connections are there. So when you go to Coleman, you got the best medical uh, education you could possibly get. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if people are aware, but, you know, Coleman started, um, yeah, we, we built the first, the HCC built the first building in the Texas Medical Center. And over the past, what, three years or so, we opened up another tower, which was literally across the street. It's connected by a, a bridge. Um, but that tower functions as a, a fully serving hospital so that students can learn in uh, on um, uh not just, I want to say dummies, but they learn on figures that they can practice with. But it, in all intents and purposes, it's a fully functional hospital. They have an ER, they have operating rooms, and the students get a chance to go in there, practice with the instructors, but they also get a chance being in the Texas Medical Center to go out and uh, train in the hospitals that we have partnerships with. I know I've been there and I I've seen it in action and it's just it's very neat the way they have it. Everything, as you say, is exactly as it would be in a regular hospital. And they uh, they go like through a triage thing. Right. And they, they, you know, go from one thing to the next thing to the next, and they communicate to each other just like you would, uh, you know, on heads yes, or yes. whatever in a regular uh, hospital. So, I right. mean, it's, it's just outstanding uh, the way they have that going. I think, you know, we're getting Glenn uh, plugged in here. Glenn, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? 
We can hear you. Good to see you. you oh, can wow. Hear you. That's cool. <laughs> I can hear you on my computer, and now you can hear me on my headset. So Yeah, we can I hear you. We appreciate, right. we appreciate okay. you being here. I'm going to turn things Thank over you. to Tony because we got a few minutes left to uh, talk with you about your long career here at HCC and the nuclear, uh, the nuclear medicine technology program. So, Tony, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can uh, pick it up with Glenn. Excellent, excellent. Welcome to the show, Glenn. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now, you have been with us for 40 years. That is a very long time uh, to be in one place like that. And I know you've had so many accomplishments. Tell us a little bit about your background, how you got to HCC and that kind of thing. Well, I got a, uh, a Bachelor of Science degree from Texas A&M in microbiology. I uh, graduated in 75. I started looking for jobs in the Texas Medical Center in, in microbiology and quickly found out that they, they didn't want somebody with a general degree in microbiology. They wanted somebody specifically trained in medical technology, which is the great thing about our programs at Houston Community College because they teach you to do specific things and to get employment. That's, that's the number one goal for them. Um, so that, that worked out real well. I mean, uh, I really took about seven years to get certified and registered in nuclear medicine. And I could have done that in two years out of high school with Houston Community College. Now, I'll never say it's a bad, bad thing uh, not to get advanced education. I always encourage our current students to go on and get baccalaureate degrees. And, and we have a really good track um, for that. If you finish our nuclear medicine technology program in the two years, uh, you can go an extra 12 weeks and, and become eligible to take the certification exam in computed tomography, which is three-dimensional x-ray. And then literally you can walk down the street to University of Texas Health, the School of Health Professions, and with an extra year, get your bachelor's degree, maybe in a modality like magnetic resonance imaging. So you're coming out with a bachelor's degree and you're qualified to do nuclear medicine, x-ray, and com computer tomography, plus magnetic resonance imaging. So if you can't find a job having all of those, there's something wrong with you. Okay. Absolutely. So that has really steadied out our program too. Uh, when we were just nuclear medicine, you had to go up and down with what was going on in the field it, itself. Now, how I started in nuclear medicine, um, I think was very unusual. I had that degree in microbiology and my father just happened to sell computers, IBM computers, to a physician in the Texas Medical Center who was the first one to do nuclear medicine uh, in the Houston area. He goes all the way back into the 50s and the 60s and was medical director in nuclear medicine over several hospitals in the area. Um, and some of the things, when I joined him in 1976, um, we still were doing all the nuclear medicine patients at Herman Hospital, Park Plaza, Medical Arts downtown, um, and so on, because they didn't have nuclear medicine at that time. Uh, we also did the first nuclear cardiology at Methodist Hospital at that time. Park Plaza was an interesting place. Back then, I would actually drive to the Park Plaza emergency room, pick up the patient, drive them back, do the scan and then take them back again. So uh, that that was very different. At Herman, they would just transport them across the street. We have personal and, attention there. <laughs> and we would do them, yes. Uh, you know, and I remember um, my first year there, the, uh, the flood that we had in the Texas Medical Center in the early 2000s, I definitely know that wasn't the first one because in 1976, it also flooded. And I remember driving the wrong way up Fannin to get patients back to Park Plaza, you know, when it flooded. So it's flooded several times uh, in the Texas Medical Center. But well, me, um, I'm sorry. 
No, go ahead. Uh, but through my dad, through my dad, who sold computers to them, I went down there to interview with them, and they were looking for people with biology degrees. So that was that was nice. Um, so, um, so, so yes. Well, I mean, so you have accomplished a lot of things while you were here at HCC. So many things. There's this huge list. Tell us a little bit about some of that. Um, well, with Houston Community College, uh, my partner, Renee Hyder, who I, who I still work with today, she's sort of semi-retired. She still works part-time as our radiation safety officer. But we wrote... Um, eight self-studies, which is everything you tell your accreditor about your program. And we were accredited, you know, all eight times. I think in the, the 38 years that her and I were working, doing that together, uh, we only got two recommendations for our, from our accreditor, and we are able to take care of those quickly. And the last four times, um, we got full accreditation. Uh, for the nuclear medicine technology program, which is what you have to have uh, in order for the students to be able to take the testing and get employed. So uh, during your time, you also did some work outside of HCC. What was that all about? I did. For uh, Renee and I both, for about a little bit over 20 years, um, we worked with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, we wrote a training manual and revised it about three times during those 20 years. But we ran a 35-hour um, course for a week uh, where we would train uh, the nuclear, the NRC um, personnel and state personnel. Um, and, and, and what we were doing was just teaching them about nuclear medicine, diagnostic and therapeutic. They might send somebody in to inspect um, a facility and they would go through the paperwork, but they wouldn't really know, you know, what the field was all about. So our job was in that 35 hour week, 35 hour course was to teach them about, you know, what nuclear medicine involved uh, so that when they came in, they came in with better education and um, could speak better with with the technologists. So. That worked out. That worked out very nice, and we learned a lot from them too. I mean, they kept kept us up on the rules and regulations, so that was that was very nice. You are also a nice side award winner, uh, which is a very big thing. It means faculty who can really teach well, know their subject, but then also able to teach students. Uh, tell us about that, and you have some other achievements that you re you received. Well, I was put up by um, our program director, Vicki Davis Littleton, um, and uh, that was a that was a really nice honor to be recognized, uh, you know, for teaching. I was ineligible for the teaching part for the 38 years I was program director. Uh, so it was nice when I went back to being a full-time faculty member that I was up and um, was one of the award winners uh, that year. Well, just real quick, what is your greatest accomplishment that you think you've made? I think the greatest accomplishment uh, has been to teach approximately 600 students, 600 people that graduated from the program and a little bit over 600, you know, that went through the program, you know, to work with those, with those students. I found out a few years ago, and I think everybody should know this, that you really need to treat your students well, uh, because uh, about four or five years ago, I was having right arm pain and went in to see my general practitioner. And she said, you need to get a nuclear medicine stress test, which is one of the tests that we perform in our field. So I went to get the test. It was done by one of my graduates of the program who said he'd let me, probably shouldn't say this, but said he'd let me look at the, look at the scan afterwards, look at the study because, you know, I trained him. I looked at that scan and went, oh, my God, <laughs> oh, my God, where is my anterior 
wall, where's my septal wall? I knew, I knew a coronary artery wasn't functioning correct. And I knew what was going to be going on. I went home, um, and started texting my general practitioner saying, do you think you can get this read quicker? Well, before I hit the send button, the manager of the department, who was another one of my graduates of the program, told me, you need to get back to St. Luke's Hospital, go to the emergency room. We've made contact with them. They know that you're coming. And what happened is bypass surgery. Not, I mean, no, heart catheterization came next and then bypass surgery on a Saturday. I still remember rolling by in the stretchers by those empty nurses stations because it was occurring on Saturday because they couldn't wait. My, my left anterior descending coronary artery called the widow maker was 95% blocked. So they needed to get in there and do the bypass. So treat your students well, treat they your become your well. providers later. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You never know. Well, Glenn Smith, we are so happy for you to be on the show with us. You finally made it in. Nuclear <laughs> Medicine Technology Program Clinical Coordinator for HC's Coleman College for Health Sciences. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Incredible story and uh, very inspirational. Boy, that's something you, uh, you know, you, you train students and uh, they, they play a part in saving your life, you know, that's, that's, just, that's, that's, that's a big thing. <laughs> that's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, okay. A couple of things to announce before we wrap up the show. One of them, big thing happening this Saturday, the Betty check Orman goes live. It's finally here. The auction features over a hundred plus packages from instant micro wine sellers to jewelries, to dinners with HCC presidents and administrators and spa themed packages. All that and more, there's something for everyone. You can bid on these packages live, virtually, Saturday night. All the proceeds go to uh, uh, our faculty who are, uh, would, you know, could go out and go on uh, seminars, take special classes, enrich their career, which of course helps our students in the long run. It's a silent auction opens today. Bidding will continue up to 9 p.m. Saturday night. All bidding, both silent and live auction, will be held via handbill. Uh, now, keep that in mind. All HCC employees are invited to join for a fun evening for this important cause. It's the Betacheck Orman Fund for Faculty Development. Make sure you join them this Saturday. We'll have some information in the social media link of our show. And real quickly, Tony, you can sign up for classes here at HCC for spring 2022. Absolutely. Just go to hccs.edu slash now and register now. We have all kinds of ways for you to take classes, so do it now. <laughs> Tomorrow on the show, Thursday, Virtual Family Fun Day, we'll be joined again by the Texas Park Rangers. Also, we have Michael Lee of HCC's American Sign Language Program to talk about how students can learn the basic skills to comprehend and practice American Sign Language. We'll be back live tomorrow, 10 a.m., right here on Up to the Minute.